discuss the collaborative effort of immune system in eradicating extracellular bacteria, elaborate the mechanism of endotoxic shock, explain the role of different immune components in tackling intracellular bacteria, describe the evasion mechanisms adopted by bacteria to counter complement system, opsonization, phagocytosis and lymphocyte function. So if I just give you the overview, these are the components that will be discussed. So we'll start with the innate barriers, complement and the cells, intra and extracellular bacteria, how they are damaged by the immune system, why phagocytosis is a key mechanism, and what is endotoxic shock, antibodies and bacteria, what is their relationship, how the antibodies are going to deal with that, and what is the role of cytotoxic lymphocytic bacterial infection, and finally the evasion mechanism. Do you all know what's the meaning of evasion? Yes. No, no. Evasion is actually bacteria and viruses are very clever. They can escape the immune response. They can hide it. They can trick the immune response. That is called as evasion. It's not invasion. It's evasion. E. Before we begin the session, there is a question that I would like to first begin with. It's a thought actually. How you see cooperation between innate and adaptive system? So there are three possible combinations that I have thought about. One is innate immune system starts and then the adaptive immune system takes over. That's one. Number two is innate immune system starts, then the innate and adaptive interface come, and finally the adaptive immune system you know, finishes the job. Or the third one, innate, innate and adaptive interface and adaptive immune system, they all are linked to each other. What do you think, which one is the most suitable mechanism that is happening all the time? C. Any example? Okay, ABC is an innate immune response and it presented to adaptive system. It fits here as well and it fits here as well. So innate cell takes the pathogen and present it to the adaptive cell. Any other example? Excellent answer. The antibodies, they are basically produced by the adaptive immune system. These antibodies, they can also activate a complement pathway. Which pathway? Classical pathway. That's one example. They can activate natural killer, the antibody dependent cell mediated cytotoxicity. Example I'm going to tell you here is cytokines of the cell mediated immunity, they are going to activate macrophages to express strong like receptor and also they tell them when the macrophage present the antigen to T cell, the T cell orders the macrophage to kill the pathogen with the help of its cytokine. Interferon gamma, that is also the example of interaction with each other. So there is nothing like innate comes, finish the job by adaptive immunity or innate, adaptive and followed by adaptive. It, is, it goes in circle and it's a teamwork. Now, immune response is a collaborative effort. Now first, we'll see what's the question? Write down the components of the innate immunity. You all know the components of the innate immunity? You can just write down those components. So we'll give you one minute to think and write them down. You can talk to each other, learn from each other. I asked about the components of the innate and adaptive system, barriers and dendritic cell, complement and natural killer, macrophages, B cells and antibodies, T lymphocytes. They are all the components of innate are these, and these are adaptive. Now, and the other important thing which I want you to understand is that how they are placed. So I just designed this, you know, simplified version. So let's say this is the, these are all the barriers, physical, chemical, biological, all the barriers are, you know, placed. So skin, for example, mucus lining. 
Second is complement system and natural killer cell. You can see that if physically you see, they are hidden. Now the next macrophages come, it hides the complement and natural killer cell. They together hide the barrier and the genetic cell. Then if B cell comes, T cell comes, they are hiding each other, but actually they are all present, they are all supporting one another, and they will be functionally intact with each other. So it's always a teamwork, nothing is working alone. There are three examples that I want to give you. Let's say a bacteria has come. It will first be blocked by the barriers, okay? Let's say if it has crossed the blood and entered the blood, inside the blood there are complement proteins. Now, gram-negative bacteria, Neisseria gonorrhoeae and Neisseria meningitis, these two are very prone to damage by complement system directly, and especially the alternative pathway. What is the end product of complement activation? MAC formation. MAC can directly kill. So it's going to kill the gram-negative bacteria. <coughs> then, here I'll give you another two examples of the bacteria. Normally bacteria, they can produce toxins or they can invade the tissues. Okay? So either they are toxic or invasive. So two bacteria, diphtheria, that causes pharyngitis, and cholera, that causes enteritis infection of the intestine, they both produce toxins, okay? So they are bacteria sets in one corner and release the toxins. Antibodies can directly neutralize these two. So I've given you four examples, two examples of directly complement mediated damage. What are these two? And just keep writing the bacteria. So by the end of lecture, you just know. So just see, gram-negative. And toxin producing. What are the two? Diphtheria and cholera. So antibodies will neutralize these two and gram-negative will be damaged by the complement system. Now, going further, factors that determine the fate of a bacteria. Before we go into the details, let's see the question two. List the causes that result in disruption of innate barriers. What can damage the innate barriers? Write on your sheets, please. See the different factors that determine the fate of a bacteria. What is the route of entry? Is it the bacteria entering through skin, respiratory tract, GI tract, urinary, or directly in the blood? One good example you have to give me. When the bacteria enters directly in the blood, where it is going to be taken? Which organ? Spleen. Excellent. And what about the other tissues when they are there? Yes, you know. And the types of bacteria, either they are gram-negative, gram-positive, mycobacteria or spirochetes. Encapsulated bacteria, they are very tricky. They are very resistant to damage by the immune system, especially for example, if you compare complement system, it's going to attack the gram-negative bacteria, but the encapsulated bacteria, it cannot attack because it has a thick, rich uh, polysaccharide capsule. And then whether it is a primary exposure with no memory or secondary exposure, so all these different factors, they can lead to the damage to the bacteria or they can help in the you know bacteria being hiding in the body. Now immunity in, in some important bacterial infection. Just some of the examples I've already talked, let's repeat them. Paranibacterium diphtheria, Vibrio cholera, they are both going to produce toxins, and these toxins, one is causing pharyngitis, the other one is causing enteritis, and they will be neutralized by the antibodies. Neisseria meningitis is going to cause meningitis, of course, as the name implies, and 
This is normally it causes bacteremia and meningitis, and it's killed by the antibodies and lytic component, and opsonized and phagocytosed by the complement system as well. Because complement system can produce MAC. What is MAC? <laughs> and it produces C3A, C4A, C5A, and other toxins. And it's also going to produce C. C3B, C2B, what they are going to do? Opsonization and phagocytosis. What is the difference between opsonization through complement and opsonization through antibody? So the complement mediated helps in just phagocytosis, while the antibody mediated leads to killing mechanism also. Very good. Now, Staphylococcus aureus is a gram-positive bacteria, and you can see here, as I said, bacteria can be invasive and toxic. This is both. It is invasive and toxic. It causes infection of the skin. That's why it will be taken up by the good cells are going to first take this bacteria and the tissues. <laughs> And later on, the neutrophils will take. Why? I'm talking about skin and tissue. Normally, where the neutrophils are present? So they have to be called from the blood into the tissues. So they cannot first engulf it. While macrophages are in the tissues, dendritic cells are in the tissues. And mycobacterium tuberculosis is a tricky pathogen. It's very resistant to immune attack. And they are, active, you know, the killing is activated inside the macrophage by T cells and cytotoxic T lymphocyte. We'll see this in detail. Okay, which pathogens can be killed by defensins? Have you heard the word defensins? Have you heard the word barriers? Yes. Chemical, Chemical barriers? Yes. So defensins are something which are. Now this is the question. What's your third question? You know any example? No, no, no. The natural antibiotics. Actually, the slide gives you a clue as well. Do you remember any defenses? In one of the slides, both the names were written. I think this question is too, we we'll just quickly go over it. There are two defensins, alpha and beta defensin. They are present in the skin, they are present in the neutrophils. So different places these are present. So the answer to this question is yes and alpha and beta defensin. So you can see here, I have given the example, neutrophils have got defensins, alpha defensin and beta defensin. The alpha defensin is going to kill directly gram positives. One of the examples is Staphylococcus aureus. Okay, beta defensin they are going to attack the gram negative bacteria. The examples are Pseudomonas aeruginosa and E. coli. So they will be killed by the defensin. So the question asks you about the antibiotics. These are to produce. This is produced by the neutrophils, and they are also present in the skin. They are also present in certain other lymphocytes. Another example is bacterial permeability inducing proteins, BPI, produced by the epithelial cells. Okay? Which, where are epithelial cells normally? Uh, skin, mucous membrane, GI tract, urogenital tract. Most of the mucous linings, they have got epithelial cells. And they are going to produce these. Now, one question I asked that macrophage and dendritic cell, they will engulf the pathogen in the tissues. Who will call the neutrophils? So you can see here that these bacterial permeability inducing proteins, they produce chemokines and cytokines. They will call the neutrophils to come. There is an infection happening here. And then the neutrophil comes and start phagocytosing the pathogen. And then the neutrophil will have alpha defensin and beta defensin for these organisms. Now, a little bit more detail about the same situation. Which immune cell encounter bacteria first in the tissues? Dendritic cells and macrophages. Is it true? No. 
Are these cells well suited for initial clearance of bacteria? If not, which cells are more suited? From the back look. Neutrophils and macrophages, they engulf the bacteria. Can they kill it as well? So, complement system. How many pathways are there? Eight. Which ones? Yes. Activated by antigen antibody, alternative pathway by bacteria, fungi, virus, or tumor cells. Mannose binding lectin pathway by microbes or terminal manos. Now, read the question. What's the question? I felt that students, they, you know, you know all the three pathways, it's activated, MAC formation, C3 convertase, anaphylatoxins, you know a lot of information, but sometimes reading the question quickly and sometimes overlooking some minor details. The question is, which complement pathway provide antibody independent innate immunity? Very clearly. And from the start, I have been telling you that antibody antigen complex activate classical pathway only. Here, it is exactly like the classical pathway, but what activates it? Lectin through mannose. It's not antibody. You know, it's very clear. It's not antibody. It's lectin activated in the mannose. So these both pathways don't need antibody. Only this pathway needs antibody. Okay. Correct? Yeah. Okay. Now, the main things that will be produced by these two pathways are membrane, all three pathways are membrane attack complex, C3A, C5A, which are the anaphylatoxins, which helps in chemotaxis, phagocytosis, and clearance of the immune complexes. All of you are aware what is clearance of the immune complexes? Yeah. Yes, they are big in size. These C3A, C4A, C5A, or C3B, they bind, break them down into small complexes, they are loaded onto the red blood cells, and then they are taken to the spleen, spleen where the macrophages will strip off these immune complexes. This is the way how immune complexes are normally cleared of your blood. And the pathogens that can be directly killed by, especially the alternative pathway are, Xeria gonorrhea, meningitis, are effectively killed by the membrane attack complex. Now going to the acute bacterial infection, two scenarios. One is unencapsulated bacteria, the other one is encapsulated bacteria. The unencapsulated bacteria example is gram-positive staphylococci. So here is the bacteria. It can be, now if it has entered the blood directly, which immune cell it will encounter first? Neutrophils. <laughs> and which innate immune proteins will it encounter first? Complement system. So the complement system is going to activate and produce anaphylatoxins. They will help the neutrophil engulf the bacteria, and then neutrophil inside has got 
lot of bacterial killing chemicals like myeloperoxidase, lysozymes, and you know nitric oxide, lot of granules, primary granules, secondary granules, they are part of the neutrophil. They are going to help the neutrophil kill the bacteria. On the other hand, when an unencapsulated bacteria is uh, produced, Streptococcus pneumoniae, that is going to activate naive T cell. Now, where it is happening? In the blood or tissues? In the primary? In the In the to the lymph node. What the macrophage is going to do? It will do phagocytosis, but will it kill it or not? Well, that depends on bacteria. If it is a simple bacteria, maybe it will be able to kill it, but if it is a complex like mycobacterium, what it's going to do, we'll discuss on another slide. Wait for the lymph node. Now, in this slide, you saw that here is a naive T cell, which has never seen a bacteria. So what is this process called when an dendritic cell? Priming. priming. This priming is occurring inside the lymph node, or for that matter, maybe inside the spleen. We don't know whether it was in the tissues or was it in the blood. Okay? Consider both situations. Now, ultimately, the T cell will be activated. Which T cell? TH1. And then TH1 will produce interferon gamma. And now we have to see the situation inside the macrophage. I've made a big figure that day that it has got two pathways. One is myeloperoxidase independent, and one is dependent. And there is another thing also inside the, so there is a phagosome, a lysosome, the inside the lysosome is which enzyme? Myeloperoxidase, catalase, these are the enzymes inside it. And we just stop here and connect the information. So interferon gamma is going to be ordering the macrophage to kill the pathogen, okay? 
Somebody asked why the macrophage will not kill. Macrophage has got phagosome, lysosome. Phagosome alone can kill some bacteria, and lysosome can have all the machinery. And then there is something else which is called as nitric oxide. Its synthesis will also kill the pathogen. On the other hand, naive T cell can also be polarized into Th2. Th2 will activate B cell. What happens normally when a B cell presents the antigen to T cell? Class switching. The antibodies are going to be class switched instead of IgM. They are going to now produce IgG1 or IgG3. And these antibodies are again helping the neutrophil to phagocytose. So it's opsonization. This will be an enhancement of phagocytosis by antibodies in acute bacterial infection. So unencapsulated bacteria go through this pathway. Encapsulated bacteria, more resistant bacteria, go through these two pathways. So either phagocytosis through neutrophils, antibody mediated, or interferon gamma mediated damage by the macrophages. Let me just hold this. We will discuss it a little later when the you know, details come. <clears throat> Another thing is why endotoxic shock is seen in gram negative bacteria? Do you all know what is endotoxin? Yes. Excellent. The wall of the gram negative bacteria, it has got LPS. And how is the whole structure? Yeah, it's a gram negative has got two layers. The inner membrane, then there is peptidoglycan, then lipid bilayer, and then the lipid bilayer has got lipopolysaccharide. This will be released as endotoxin. It's called as endotoxin of LPS. Macrophages and monocytes have got special receptors for these. And these are called as tall like receptor 4. You can see the bacteria has come. They have released LPS, lipopolysaccharide. It will be recognized by the tall like receptors. And once it's recognized, the macrophages will be activated. What does activated macrophage mean? They can know. Phagocytosis is eating. They are able to produce H2O2, hydrogen peroxide. When they are able to produce H2O2, now they are called as activated. And once they are activated, they are going to produce pro-inflammatory cytokines, IL-1, IL-6, TNF-alpha. They all are going to affect the liver to produce these things. Pump C-reactive protein, complement, mannose binding lectin, fibrinogen, and they have some other effects as well. They cause fever and they have got very strong effect on the blood, inside the blood vessel and on the blood vessel. What are these features? First thing is, there will be activation of the epithelium. Normally, you all know that the cells are in the middle of the blood while the plasma is around it. So there is a streamlined flow. Whenever it is disturbed, the epithelial cells have got some uh, receptors, then the neutrophils start binding to the epithelial cells. The platelet activation takes place. So first thing is there will be platelet activation by these epithelial cells. Increase intravascular permeability. What will be the result? Uh, Fluid will come out into the extracellular space. Then smooth muscle contraction. What will it do? Like anaphylaxis. Blood vessel dilation. And there will be hypovolemia. Okay? So there is hypovolemia, there is fall in blood pressure, there is loss of fluid in the tissue, and there is hemorrhagic necrosis. In the end, there is multiple organ failure. So the what are the vital organs? Heart. Heart. And? Liver. Okay, one of the tasks is you have to go today and read about what are the vital organs? Okay. So these mainly the multiple organ failures is of vital organs. Okay. And this will be caused by these all and a combination of these. So pro-inflammatory cytokines are directly produced, no T cells involved, 
no B cells involved, no you know uh, other activation of the neutrophils. Directly, macrophage recognize the LPS. If too much LPS in the body, this is endotoxic shock, and these are the mechanism which is resulting in it, and these are the pro-inflammatory cytokines are responsible for it. Yes. Is again LPS and the TLR. Okay. What are the first receptors, innate receptors that recognize the pathogen? Pattern yeah. recognition receptors. Can you give me any example? So TLR, tall-like receptor is one of the example of TRR and it is able to recognize LPS directly. When it is directly you know, recognized, macrophages are activated, now they are producing H2O2 and they are going to produce IL-1, IL-6, TNF-alpha. These pro-inflammatory cytokines are going to affect on the blood vessel, change their permeability, expression of the other receptors, platelet activation, smooth muscle contraction, so hypovolemia, clotting, and multiple organ failure. Is it clear to everyone? Yes. This can not the second type. This one? No. So in this particular case, you know, if there is uh, endotoxic shock is normally when the quantity of bacteria or the number of bacteria is too much. It will activate the complement system as well, but it will uh, do this kind of activation and activate macrophages as well. So it depend when it is less, the immune system, uh, macrophages are going to kill it and the complement is going to kill it, the situation resolves. But if the quantity is too much or sometimes, you know, the, how it is, you know, entering the body, like I said, sometimes cannula entered or some other reason that produce or injects a lot of pathogen in the body, that is going to result in endotoxic shock, not in normal, simple infection. And neutrophils also have got receptor for uh, lipopolysaccharides and it can also add to the same phenomena, but mainly it's done by the macrophages. Now coming to the bacterial killing, first we have to read the question. What are the steps of phagocytosis? Phagocytosis will take place. What are the receptors? Very good. CR1, CR2, and FC receptors. FC for antibody, CR for these. Once it's engulfed, it will form phagosome. If it is just the complement, the killing mechanism is not started. But if it is together, antibody and complement or antibody alone, the killing mechanism starts. How it starts? There is a special pump here, photon pump. That will make this phagosome acidic. pH will drop, it will become acidic. Then there are oxygen reactive species are going to produce. After this, there is another thing inside the macrophages that is called as lysosome. It has got an enzyme called myeloperoxidase. Myeloperoxidase will result in the formation of? They will join each other. Phagosome will form a bind to lysosome, phagolysosome, and the myeloperoxidase is going to cause the formation of H2O2, hydrogen peroxide. 
But this will happen when a special receptor is activated. Through interferon? Gamma. Who will produce interferon gamma? T cells. Where are the T cells? Okay. And then it will also trigger the formation of nitric oxide. I said nitric oxide will be formed. Okay? Or reactive oxygen intermediates. But mainly it's the nitric oxide that is formed. So proton pump may become, you know, this uh, phagosome may become acidic. That is good killing. But when the myeloperoxidase convert hydrogen peroxide, that is more strong killer. Finally, when the nitric oxide is produced, that is very, very strong, you know, killer. So they are going to kill it, but the final message is coming through interferon gamma, through T cells. All that makes sense? Now we are going to link this to a clinical scenario. There is a tuberculosis patient, latent tuberculosis. Do you all know what is latent tuberculosis? So the TB is not active TB, it's just in the dormant phase, okay? And if that patient has got AIDS, if he get AIDS, then normally what is the uh, problem in AIDS patients? Uh, no. CD4 counts drop very low. So when there are no CD4, this T cell will not be there to produce interferon gamma, to cause activation of myeloperoxidase or nitric oxide synthesis. Is that clear? Yes. So when this is not happening, the latent or the hidden macrophage, the mycobacterium that can become active. So that's why latent tuberculosis patient, when they get AIDS, their TB become active as well. And the mechanism is this. Everyone understands this? Okay, so the AIDS patient has got low CD4 counts. If the CD4 counts are low, no T cells, not those no T cells, but very less T cells, less interferon gamma, less activation of pyroperoxidase, less nitric oxide synthesis, and less killing of the mycobacterium. So when they, this all check and balance is gone, mycobacterium is already hiding, he will think, okay, nobody's going to kill me, and start creating trouble and become active. Okay, now we will see certain examples inside the macrophage of the bacteria that are going to cause trouble. So first thing is streptococcus pneumoniae. Is it encapsulated or unencapsulated? Encapsulated. encapsulated. So the encapsulated bacteria, as I said, they are very tricky. They will first block the recognition by, so this is the recognition mechanism, complement and antibody mediated. These encapsulated bacteria stops that. So they don't allow their recognition and they don't allow engulfing. That's number one. So number two, mycobacterium tuberculosis. He's very clever. He can do three things. Number one, it will stop the proton pump. I told you there's a proton pump that makes the phagosome acidic. Number two, it can stop the binding of phagosome with the lysosome. Number three, the interferon gamma is going to come outside. It will stop the uh, you know, response of this whole macrophage to this interferon gamma. Now what's the last question? So we already know that. Myeloperoxidases are going to cause H2O2, they have, normally they have got what they have, lysosomes, they have got defenses, they have got myeloperoxidase, so a lot of enzymes are present inside these lysosomes, and they are going to help in the formation of H2O2, they are going to help in the formation of nitric oxide. And hypochlorite as well. Nitric oxide and hypochlorite. I don't know how much time is left. Now, there is another group of uh, bacteria, Shigella and monocytogens. What they can do, they will break the membrane of the phagosome and go inside the cytoplasm. So normally the phagosome is formed when it's engulfed, taken inside, but these bacteria are clever. They can break the membrane of the phagosome and come inside the cytoplasm and then start to multiply. So I was telling you that the bacteria have got their own tricks. They can trick the immune system. We started with the 
encapsulated streptococcus pneumoniae, then was mycobacterium with three tricks, then was Shigella and Listeria monocytogens, and finally, there are certain bacteria that can also produce catalase, and this catalase is going to destroy H2O2. And which bacteria can do that? Staphylococcus aureus and Klebsiella pneumoniae. Do you understand? No. No. So, we said that lysosome has got which enzyme? Myeloperoxidase. It's going to cause the production of H2O2. Okay? Then, there are certain bacteria that have their own enzyme. They are called as catalase producing. What, which are these bacteria? Staphylococcus and Klebsiella. They will destroy myeloperoxidase. Or, sorry, hydrogen peroxide. They will disintegrate hydrogen peroxide. So, the killing mechanism will be disturbed. Okay, now we are going to see the functions of antibodies with relation to the bacteria. Normally, bacteria, how they invade and what they do, and at which step antibodies can get involved. First thing is, here is a bacteria. It has got certain, uh, you know, hair-like structures that help in the attachment of these bacteria to the cells. That's the first thing. Normal, you know, healthy cells can be attacked by the bacteria. Then inside those cells, they can proliferate if it is suitable for them. That's, I'm telling you the normal steps of how bacteria can uh, you know, survive and proliferate. Then they can, if they avoid phagocytosis by any trick, they can then start producing toxins and either invade with the help of certain enzymes. So these are simply the steps that are followed by the bacteria. How the antibodies are going to counter them, first thing is, antibodies can bind to the capsule and the fimbria of the uh, bacteria or ticoic acid, for example, in the gram-positive bacteria, and block their attachment. Okay, so this is kind of neutralization. They don't allow them to enter the host cells. Number two, they can trigger the complement system through classical pathway and cause directly damage. Example is, streptococci, streptococci will be damaged by the... And third is, the antibodies can also neutralize the repellents. You know, the things, for example, any enzyme that is produced by the bacteria to stop their phagocytosis, they can neutralize them as well. And finally, they can neutralize the toxins. Do you know any toxins? Did we talk about any toxins today? Diphtheria and cholera. They can just, uh, stop the toxins, neutralize them, and they can also stop the enzymes. Uh, normally, any tissue is made up of cells, fibers, and ground substance. Is that correct? The ground substance has got, you know, it can be damaged by hyaluronidase. It's an enzyme which can attack the hyaluronic acid in the ground substance. And that is how bacteria invades. I told you, bacteria can produce toxins or it can invade the tissues. So these antibodies can block this enzyme and it can also block the toxins produced by the bacteria. Now overview of CD4 mediated cell response. What happens in that? You already know, dendritic cell will present the antigen to naive T cell and it can go through three different possible polarization. Either a Th1 mediated, which will produce interferon gamma, macrophage is activated, as I showed here, and they will kill the bacteria inside them. Number two, Th2 mediated, interferon gamma will cause what? Class switching. And these antibodies will help in phagocytosis, neutralization, or uh, opsonization. Then, the third pathway, it's slightly different. It is mediated by which? Okay, when dendritic cell produce IL-12, Th1 are produced. But what dendritic cell release to produce Th2? Four. 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 And what does it produce to make Th17? Uh, IL-17. TGF-beta. IL-6 and TGF-beta, when they are produced, they will become Th17. And then Th17 produce IL-17, IL-22, which can activate neutrophils. So the neutrophils are going to then deal with the 
uh, extracellular bacteria, and where will it do it? It will do it at the mucosal surfaces, intestine in particular. Now, the direct actions of cytotoxic T lymphocytes, so far we have been you know, reading or learning that cytotoxic T lymphocytes deal with intracellular pathogen, and the main example was viruses and tumor cells. But there are certain obligate intracellular bacteria also which stay inside the cell. Any examples? Tuberculosis, very good. Here are certain other invasive salmonella, shigella, and chlamydia. These are also the examples of intracellular bacteria. Now, what they are going to do if normally a host cell has got these, which receptor is going to present the antigen? MHC class? One. Because it will be recognized by CD8 T cells. And another scenario is that the cell that has got these pathogens, it will apoptose program cell death and the antigen will come out and it will be taken by the dendritic cell and instead of the cell which has got MHC class 1, dendritic cell presented to CD8 cell. This kind of presentation is called as cross priming. This is simple priming while this one is called as cross priming. In both the cases, cytotoxic T lymphocyte is activated, it's going to produce activation of macrophage through interferon gamma, TNF-alpha, and it can also cause interferon gamma-mediated macrophage activation, and itself it produces perforins. What perforins can do? Make holes in the cell, while granulosin is going to cause programmed cell death. And finally, this is the summary of, uh, you know, involvement of different cells starting from the pathogen, natural killer cell, lymphatic cell, complement, proteins, inflammatory cytokines that are produced. You can figure it out yourself. Go home, sit, and watch everything. Now there are two tasks for you at the end of today's session. One is, what is the difference between acute infection and primary immune response? Okay? And the other one is, is there any difference between chronic infection and secondary immune response? So you are going to go home, read about it, get the answers, and next session I'm going to ask you. Apart from this, if you can, if you want to ask me any question, you are welcome. Anything that you have not understood?